this doesn't work by getting it from that. There we go. Okay. Well, the, thank you uh, for inviting me here to speak. And I, I'm going to talk about racial disparities in cancer, but really uh, use diffuse large B cell lymphoma, an area that is close to my uh, work in clinical research as a microcosm and an example for how racial disparities play out for this one uh, particular cancer. Here are my disclosures, which are predominantly related to my work in clinical trials uh, and clinical consultation. Uh, probably my biggest disclosure is that I'm a, a Seattle native and was born and grew up here and am very excited about the, the weather here today to uh, have a change from Atlanta. Um, so when we think about racial disparities in cancer, this is uh, just to, to point out two uh, major impactful uh, pieces of work that comes from the American Cancer Society on an annual basis, where they provide uh, cancer, uh, can you see the pointer? No. They provide cancer uh, facts and figures for Hispanic uh, patients and from African Americans on a semi-annual uh, basis. Um, and here, just to show examples of differences in uh, racial disparities in incidence of cancer when you look at the patterns of, uh, of uh, malignancies in Hispanic uh, and non-Hispanic whites in terms of the incidences of leukemia and lymphoma, to know that those incidence patterns really need to help us to identify the areas that we would target. I, I just came here from another meeting that uh, was in uh, Rio earlier this week. Uh, where we were looking at uh, incidence patterns across Central America and South America for cancer and identifying and training uh, junior faculty and staff in the, both of those areas to be able to address those incidence patterns so that there were expert clinical investigators in each of those areas to address that. Likewise, the, uh, another part of this report for African Americans that comes out on a semi-annual basis from the American Cancer Society looks at differences in terms of the five-year and uh, outcomes for different cancer subtypes by race, which are other tools that help us to identify, like you heard at the, the presentations at the uh, very beginning of the day today, the, the places that we need to target most in terms of racial disparities. With the American Cancer Society, I've worked uh, very closely with uh, my good friend, uh, Amadin uh, Jamal, who is there, and Lauren Terrace, who leads the hematologic malignancies. Uh, other folks, uh, uh, and uh, Carol DeSantis, who's also there. Other uh, contributors to his work was Lindsay Morton from the National Cancer Institute, and my good friend Jim Sirhan from the uh, Mayo Clinic, who you'll see later in this presentation. And this really was an effort to be able to define the uh, lymphoid cancers across the United States by the WHO subtype. Uh, and then to be able to find both the incidence patterns, but also differences in outcome uh, by uh, race and, and gender. And you can see here that when you look at different hematologic malignancies, chronic lymphocytic leukemia and diffuse large B cell shown here, uh, shown in the, uh, in the dark blue are the two year and then five year and then 10 year overall survival statistics by race and gender, and here just comparing black males and white males, you can see there are marked differences in, in five-year and 10-year overall survival statistics across uh, a number of hematologic malignancies. And really, these are the types of disparities that we need to try and address where, where those marked differences occur. And so I'm just going to uh, turn to diffuse large B cell lymphoma for the rest of this talk as w one of those malignancies where we've seen disparities uh, in incidence and in outcomes and look at ways that we might need to dig deeper there. So diffuse large B cell lymphoma is the most common lymphoid malignancy, as you saw from that pie chart. Uh, the non-Hodgkin's lymphomas together represent about the seventh most common cancer in the United States, and this is about 30% of all those. This is, as its name implies, a, a histologic pattern with large cells uh, that has an aggressive behavior. And in the absence of therapy, about 92% of people with diffuse large B cell lymphoma will be dead within a year. So it uh, is a kind of malignancy that is rapidly fatal if left untreated. But it, we also think of it as the mo one of the most common curable malignancies where more than half of individuals are cured with uh, standard therapy that is available throughout the United States. Mm -hmm. Um, these are really the survival curves that define that uh, in terms of chemotherapy regimens. What has been defined, this is work from Richard Fisher that first showed that with standard CHOP chemotherapy that 
despite whatever kind of chemotherapy uh, regimen we give, it was no better than CHOP, including my, my most favorite name for uh, chemotherapy regimen, Promace Cytobomb, which is a chemotherapy that sounds like it's got to work, uh, but <laughs> was still no better than CHOP. Um, and then uh, more recently in data from Bertrand Coffier and supported by data from the United States, we found that adding the antibody therapy rituximab uh, to CHOP chemotherapy improved overall survival. And from that time in 2002, when this was first published, to the present, we've designed new regimens and, it, and other, other approaches to giving chemotherapy, but none of them have been better than this standard of care, and that remains the standard of care at present time, and we'll return to that throughout the talk. The other thing that we know about diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, though, is although diffuse large B-cell lymphoma is considered a kind of cancer that has a five-year uh, overall survival of about 50 percent, and about 50 percent of people are cured, and that's what we tell patients, that's actually not true. And when you think about diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, what we now know is that there are different subtypes of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma germinal center-like diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, where with older CHOP chemotherapy, the uh, five-year overall survival was about 60 percent, and we now know that's now closer to 80 percent. And with activated B-cell-like diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, that survival is only about 30 percent. So we have the biological capacity to be able to distinguish these subtypes where you have patients that have about an 80 percent chance of cure with standard chemotherapy and other patients who have about a 30 percent chance of cure, although we sum that together and tell people on average they have about a 50 percent chance of cure, which um, is not really true for each of those subtypes. That also can be defined by immunohistochemistry means, and we'll talk a little bit about how that uh, comes into play. And I'd be interested in hearing uh, feedback from uh, Dr. Garcia, uh, maybe in the question and answer session, about how some of these tools might be a, a applied more broadly uh, in the international setting. So this work in uh, racial disparities and diffuse large B-cell lymphoma really uh, began as an effort that really was not uh, intended to be focused on disparities. We were doing a very simple study to try and understand outcomes for patients with uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma broadly and diffuse large B cells specifically in the state of Georgia, looking to show that the outcomes in the state of Georgia with treatment were relatively similar to what they are in the United States, and that we could do clinical trials in Georgia that would serve as a microcosm for what we saw in the United States. But what we, what that turned out not to be true that outcomes in Georgia were actually worse than they were in the rest of the United States, and in part related to some of these racial disparities that I'll talk about. Uh, so this is work that we started by looking at the SEER the, the data set, so the surveillance epidemiology and end results data set that you heard uh, at the very beginning from Edith uh, Mitchell, uh, which was one of those things that was created by the National Cancer Act. Uh, and looked at patients with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma that were diagnosed in that data set. And this represents about 26 percent of the U.S. population. And what we found there, as had been known before, was that patients with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma was much less common in black individuals, who are here shown the incidence uh, rates uh, by uh, race that you can see is less for, for black individuals, with about 2,500 cases over that uh, time period. Uh, compared to about uh, 30,000 cases in, in uh, white individuals. But the other thing that we found that was actually quite surprising is that if you look at black patients with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma as compared to white patients, they were diagnosed a little bit more than a decade younger than white patients with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, which previously had not been, uh, had not been known. One of, the, one of the prognostic factors that we know for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma is patients who are over the age of 60 tend to do worse, and about 64 percent versus 36 percent of uh, individuals who were black uh, were diagnosed under the age of 60. So you would expect, based on that prognostic factor, that their outcomes should be better, uh, since that's one of the strongest predictive factors of outcome in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And this just shows the distribution of age at diagnosis with black patients shown here in the red versus white patients, where we commonly think of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma as a kind of cancer of the 60s and 70s. That's not true for black individuals who present at a much younger age uh, distribution. Um, 
The other thing that, uh, that when this first came out that this was attributed to something uh, that uh, Dr. Abalafia touched upon is that's the relationship between HIV uh, and lymphoma where there's a common association. So one of the first critiques of these findings was that uh, perhaps because HIV was uh, more prevalent in the black population who, uh, who di were diagnosed with lymphoma, that maybe HIV explained these differences in age. And when you look at black and white individuals who are HIV positive with lymphoma, that was true that they were, it was more common in black individuals and that they presented as a younger age. But when you look at HIV negative individuals, um, there, there was still a younger age distribution for African American individuals, uh, even in that setting. Uh, one of the challenges with this data set is that now uh, HIV has actually been delinked from the SEER uh, data set, so it's not as easy to be able to get access to these data, but we got it at exactly the right time when the, before that, that happened. The other thing that we found as part of this endeavor is that this was not only true for diffuse large B cell lymphoma, but it was true for a number of hematologic uh, cancers that black uh, individuals presented a year, at an age that was about a decade younger. Uh, for chronic lymphocytic leukemia, for follicular lymphoma, uh, all of which are diseases that are expected to occur in older individuals, but we're incurring in individuals where they were much younger who were African American. When you look at the features at the uh, presentation, these tended to be uh, individuals who presented with higher stage disease, uh, as has been seen for other malignancies uh, like uh, colorectal cancer and, uh, and breast cancer among black patients. And then when you look at survival, uh, shown here in the blue line, the survival was actually inferior for black patients compared uh, to white patients or for patients of any other race, uh, shown in the other two curves. So one of the questions that may arise as a result of what I showed you at the very beginning is are there differences in the kinds of therapy that are given to black patients versus white patients in terms of who receives chemoimmunotherapy or RCHOP? And do modern uh, treatments impact outcomes for patients? And so we actually sought to look at this with the American Cancer Society and another data set, the National Cancer Database, in collaboration with uh, Otis Brawley and many others uh, at, the, at the ACS. This is a data set that is also a national data set that covers more than 75% of all hospitals in the United States. And we looked at patients in a relatively uh, sweet spot uh, in between 2001 and 2004, where there were data coded on whether patients got uh, immunotherapy or rituximab uh, and chemotherapy uh, during that, uh, that time frame. What we found there is, that again, that black patients presented at a younger age uh, in the United States more commonly had advanced stage disease at diagnosis. Uh, and then well, in looking at who got uh, chemoimmunotherapy versus chemotherapy alone, what we found is that the factors that affected that were race uh, shown here uh, and insurance status, uh, whether they were uninsured or Medicaid insured. In all those situations, they were less likely uh, to get chemoimmunotherapy and more likely to get chemotherapy as their regimen. So 2001 to 2004 is right in that sweet spot where I mentioned where we first knew that chemoimmunotherapy should be the preferred approach for all patients. And you're seeing in those time frames that it was much less common uh, for them to receive that. Um, to somewhat of a surprise, we, for Hispanic patients, we did not see that those same trends were true. But what we did see in those situations was that there was actually much less common for Hispanic patients to even get chemotherapy versus no chemotherapy at all. And you can see that the same uh, was true across uninsured and black patients as well, that there were people that were not even getting the standard chemotherapy that we thought even back to the early 1990s. So one of the real challenges during the time frame that we did this work is that we didn't have direct uh, linkages to outcomes, so we could see what the differences were in treatment in this data set. We could see what the differences in survival were in the other SEER data set, but those two were not linked together. Uh, and there was really insufficient uh, follow-up to be able to look at outcomes in that setting. And so we started to look uh, at that in another setting uh, where I uh, created a collaboration uh, with the University of Alabama, Birmingham at that time, to look at black and white differences in the treatment and outcomes across our institution and, and their institution, where we had more complete capture of all the characteristics of diagnosis, the exact use of the chemotherapy that was given, and the outcomes for those patients. 
And you can see here in, in this uh, data set, when you look at black patients versus white patients uh, treated at Emory and the University of Alabama, uh, Birmingham, during a, a little bit broader time range, that as is true for most academic medical centers, uh, that patients treated at the academic medical center were younger than what we see in the general population of the United States, uh, but there were still was this age differences in, in disparity. The other thing that we had there were more complete access to uh, laboratory data, so lactate dehydrogenase, or LDH, is a predictive factor for poor outcomes in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma and other lymphomas. And you can see that black patients more commonly predicted, uh, were, were, were commonly were associated with having a, a lactate dehydrogenase that was greater than the upper limit of normal, um, and so would be associated with poorer outcomes than you might expect. The other thing that we found in this data set is that if you look even in patients that were treated with the exact same chemotherapy, so treated with CHOP chemotherapy, and look at black patients versus white patients, even when they were given the exact same treatment in the exact same treatment setting, there were differences in survival. We did not see those same differences in survival when our CHOP was given as the standard therapy, so what the current standard therapy is. But with the older standard uh, therapy that occurred in the earlier years of patients who were diagnosed, there was a clear difference in terms of overall survival. This suggests that in addition to the socioeconomic factors that were associated with differences in treatment that might produce differences in outcome, that there might also be biological factors that are associated with these differences in outcome. And if you think back to the slides that you saw earlier about uh, the relationships between biological, social, and economic uh, factors in the multi-level model that you, you saw from Dr. Rees at the outset, that we need to think about all those factors when we're trying to think about how uh, treatment disparities occur by race. So one of the things that we've gone to is to uh, actually try and look back to the biology uh, by race in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, much in the same way that this similar work has happened in breast cancer. And we used immunohistochemistry stains to be able to separate those two subtypes that I talked about at the beginning, germinal center-like B-cell lymphoma and non-germinal center-like B-cell lymphoma using tissue microarrays to put that together. And so using those patients from University of Alabama, Birmingham, uh, and the, the patients from uh, Emory that uh, formed that set that I showed you, we looked at those differences by black and white patients. And here in a relatively small data set of 26 uh, black patients and 51 uh, white patients across those two institutions, what you can see is the more favorable uh, subtype, germinal center-like diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, occurs in about 50 to 60 percent of people, depending on which algorithm you use to be able to, to uh, classify them. And, and those are really close to the expected uh, numbers that you see published in the literature for those two subtypes. Whereas uh, with black patients, this more favorable subtype only occurred about 30% of the time in this population, suggesting that there may be biological differences in this patient population. Um, these were provocative preliminary data that we have used to actually look forward uh, to other settings. Um, but one of the major challenges of these data uh, are that they, one, are not uh, linked to broader populations, and they're not linked uh, well to genomic assessments of those outcome uh, in addition to the, the uh, the histological assessments that I showed. So from there, what we've done is we actually uh, utilize that uh, with a number of academic medical centers. And here's Jim Surhan, who I alluded to at the beginning of the talk. Jim and I put together a multi-institutional uh, cohort of, uh, of cancer centers involving Emory, the Mayo Clinic, MD Anderson, Washington University in St. Louis, the University of Sylvester uh, in Miami, or the University of Miami at the Sylvester Cancer Center. University of Iowa, the University of Rochester, and the Well uh, Cornell uh, Medical Center, where our goal was to recruit uh, close to 13,000 uh, patients uh, with lymphoma across all subtypes, including a little bit more than 3,500, 3,600 patients with diffuse large B cell lymphoma, where we collect clinical data across those patients, but also collect tissue samples to create tissue microarrays, tumor DNA and RNA and with a central repository of, uh, of samples uh, from peripheral blood, and additionally collect the clinical epidemiological and pathological data for all of these patients to be able to understand what those uh, disparities uh, are. And what we uh, 
hope to do across the subsets. I mentioned the number of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma patients, but this will also be the largest collection of African-American uh, patients with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma uh, ever assembled, uh, and hopefully the largest collection of Hispanic uh, patients with lymphomas ever assembled. These centers that I mentioned were purposely uh, selected. So at University of Miami, we're selectively recruiting Hispanic patients from that population, as well at MD Anderson and Wash U uh, and Emory or, or in uh, Cornell are the locations where we're recruiting the greatest number of African American patients in this uh, population. Uh, and I'm proud to say, so this is our accrual up to uh, our, our first two years, and we've accrued uh, more than 3,000 patients across that, that time period into this data set, and we just uh, passed 4,000 patients just a, f a few months ago. The second thing that we've done with using this approach to recruitment is we've actually, as you saw in the talk at the beginning, started to geocode uh, and map all the patients with lymphomas across the state of Georgia. And here you can see the population density, uh, the, sorry, the, 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 um, the case incidence density for cases of lymphoma uh, within populations. And you can see markedly different, different density for patients who are African American or black who have diffuse large B cell lymphoma compared to white patients with diffuse large B cell lymphoma in the state of Georgia. We've now linked that uh, LEO or the lymphoma epidemiology of outcomes um, approach to our state cancer registry. And we're using the state of Georgia cancer registry now to recruit every single patient that's diagnosed with lymphoma in the state of Georgia to be able to collect all those same tissue samples uh, and biological data along with clinical and epidemiologic data for the entire state. We've uh, had grants that I showed you uh, related to our earlier work in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma uh, and now have a, a new U01 uh, grant and a V Foundation grant to be able to go to the next level and actually do genomic sequencing uh, on these patients with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, where we'll be doing sequencing both of the diffuse large B-cell tumor and matched normal samples to be able to try and identify differences between the, the tumor and matched normal. Uh, this is work that we've done in collaboration with Sandeep Dave that was just recently published in Cell, uh, where we did this for about 1,000 patients with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, characterizing their whole sequencing. About 100 of those were patients uh, from Emory that participated in that, and about 70 of those were African-American patients, where we'll now have the capacity to be able to look to see differences uh, in the sequencing and outcomes for those patients. So, with that, I will stop, and I'm happy to take uh, questions at the end. Great. Thank you. Actually, I'm going to introduce you from here. So uh, to stay on target, we're going we're gonna to move on to our second talk. And um, so I'd like to uh, introduce uh, to you uh, Dr. Shaw. Um, uh, who's a uh, practicing medical oncologist and hematologist. He, uh, his practice is in Peace Health uh, United General Hospital uh, here in Washington. And his area of interest is health outcomes and health disparities among cancer patients. Uh, he's well published. He's presented uh, over 100 times, including uh, in journals and meetings. Um, and he is uh, nationally and internationally known for his work uh, and his global health initiatives, which have been fantastic. He's, uh, he's also had the distinction of developing the nation's first statewide personalized cancer care tumor board uh, as president of the Idaho Society of, of Clinical Oncology. Uh, and uh, besides being a patient advocate uh, and a humanitarian, uh, he's founded uh, the B'nai Tara Foundation uh, and has promoted health and education for underprivileged communities. So without any further ado, uh, Dr. Shaw. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ruiz. Thank you. So um, my talk is low tech. It is not really high tech. So I'm not going to talk about any precision medicine or immunotherapy. I'm going to talk about simple issues about access to care, access to cancer care. It works now. <laughs> <laughs> So I do not have any relevant financial disclo disclosure. So um, do you know how many uh, millions of cancer cases are diagnosed each year? It is approximately 14 to 15 million cancer, care, uh, cancer cases every single year. 
and it is expected that we would have 20 million new cancer cases by 2025. And the largest number of cases are supposed to be in low-income countries, the countries that does not, do not have enough cancer docs, that do not have adequate infrastructure. So, um, and as you see, approximately 8 million cancer patients die on an average right now. Now, if you look at this, um, uh, this slide, so this is a more developed region, and this is less developed region, low-income countries and high-income countries. As you can see, the kind of cancers we see in high-income countries are very different compared to those that we see in low-income countries. For example, esophageal cancer, stomach cancer, liver cancer, these are more common in low-income countries. Cervical cancer are very common among low-income countries. As a matter of fact, cervical cancer is the commonest cause of death among women from cancer in low-income countries. And uh, this is a cancer that can be prevented, that can be treated, and yet it accounts for the largest number of deaths from cancer in low-income countries. If you look at mortality, now in Americas, uh, we have around 21% of all cancer cases and 16% of uh, all cancer deaths. If you look at Asia, it has 48% of all cancer cases, 55% of all cancer deaths. Africa, 6% of all cancer cases, and 7.2% of all cancer deaths. So as you can see, even though we have large number of cancer patients diagnosed every year, our mortality is gradually improving. However, these are the vast areas. India and China alone account for one, uh, at least 40% of uh, world population, or 30% of world population, and that is huge. And those are the areas that have large number of cancer patients and largest mortality rates. So um, what are the challenges? So we have a number of challenges. How many of you have been to low-income countries? Most of you. How many of you are originally from low-income countries? <coughs> Some of you. So those of you who have been from uh, low-income countries, you know how things are. You don't have money. Even though India and China are getting wealthier than before, you know, the sheer amount of problem, sheer number of people is so huge that it is impossible to invest all the money in cancer care. And specifically when you have so many competing issues that you have to deal with, you have infections, malaria, and whatnot. So a second issue is insurance coverage. So we had wonderful discussion uh, in the first session about uh, private and public pay and all that. So most of these places do not have good insurance coverage. As a matter of fact, more than 80% of the people in Nepal and India may not have any insurance. So they will depend primarily on public healthcare system. Um, if you don't have money, you don't get treatment. You, you, don't, you can go and see the doctor, who may be a general medicine doctor, trying to give you cancer drugs, chemo drugs. So that's where we are at. We do not have good health, you know, trained healthcare providers. Nursing shortage, tremendous. And we all know how critical it is to have oncology nursing program for a successful cancer center. Most of the low-income countries do not have um, oncology and nursing programs. They don't have much resources. Equipments are inequitably distributed. Now, we talk about disparities in cancer care. If you look at India, India is a huge country, more than 1.2 billion people, four times as big as the United States. If you go to Delhi, Delhi will have few cancer centers and state-of-the-art hospitals. All right, so Delhi is a major city. So everybody who goes to India goes to Delhi or Mumbai because they, they are the cities so they are connected to. But that is not where most of India lives. Most of the India lives in rural areas. So if you look at 800 million people in the, India would be living in rural areas and they don't have any access to care. They don't have hospitals. They don't have cancer docs. 
and they don't have, uh, people can't afford care because people who live in big cities are relatively wealthier compared to those who live in rural areas. Same thing with Nepal. Everybody who goes to Nepal goes to Kathmandu or Pokhara. How many of you have been to Nepal? So, sure, so you go to Kathmandu or Pokhara, and these are the wealthiest cities in the country. So Kathmandu alone, it is a city of uh, two million people or so, has two public cancer centers and a number of private hospitals that provide cancer services. Get out of Kathmandu, there is absolutely nothing. So in a country of 30 million people, two million people have great access to care you know, relatively, and 28 million people have no access to care. So that is exactly what, what we're dealing with, not only here, but internationally, everywhere. So lack of cancer registries, that is another major, major problem. We all know how CR database has been. It has been tremendously helpful in understanding cancer care and our problems and how we can help improve ourselves. Those places don't have cancer registries. So you do not know how to create a credible cancer plan, how to uh, come up with uh, preventative uh, plans. So this is something I wanted to show to you. So as you see, Nigeria, it is a country of 180 million people. It has nine radiation therapy machines and 30 radiation oncologists. And IAE recommends one machine per 250,000 people. So Bellingham, a small town, 200,000 people where I live, has a state-of-the-art cancer center, all right? And if you look at Nigeria, 180 million people, they have nine radiation therapy machines. Nepal, country of 30 million people, a couple of radonc machines, outside the, uh, and, and they hardly have anything outside the capital city. India has one machine per 2.1 million people. And the five commonest cancers in India, they're breast cancer, cervical cancer, oral cancer, lung cancer, and col colorectal cancer. And all of us know radiation therapy is a critical component of treatment of these cancers. So, what is Aju? Dr. Aju Matthew is here? No? Well, he recently published this paper in JGO and did a fantastic job in coming up with a physician to patient ratio. So if you look at this, vast areas in Africa have hardly any oncologists. If you look at India, one uh, medical oncologist sees 500 to 1,000 patients. Does anybody know the average number of uh, cancer patients one medical oncologist sees in America, in the United States? 350, that is the average right now. It is much less in academic center, but private practice, 350 patients a year. So it tells you the vast differences in um, a number of uh, uh, the, the physician availability. So one of the problem is uh, availability of manpower Question is, how can we make it affordable? Can we treat cancer for a dollar a day? How many of you think uh, it is possible? None of you. Well, I'm an optimist. <laughs> and that's why I'm a cancer doc. So. <laughs> I do believe that with uh, newer technology, I see Dr. Poon, Hoi Fang Poon, and he's going to talk about technology and all that uh, in cancer care. I think uh, with uh, um, the, the improving manufacturing facilities across the world, improvement in um, technology will help us with this. How many of us thought 40 years ago we could buy a state-of-the-art computer for $200, right? So just because the technology is expensive right now does not mean it will stay expensive 10 years from now. Now, can we think of a better model to improve cancer care or healthcare in general? Can we have a Starbucks model of uh, uh, medical practice where you have drive-through clinics? 
So essentially, a cancer patient come, comes here. Somebody say, hey, how can I help you? Patient tells you the symptoms. Then the nurse is going to take vitals, physician examines, looks at the data, and uh, provides the prescription and advice. Now, as you know, colon cancer patients, you give them a treatment, you see that patient in three months or six months, you have colonoscopy report, CT scan, CEA, and blood counts. Question is, uh, can you find anything on physical examination if CT scan is negative and CEA is normal? Do we truly have to examine that particular patient? Or can we say, hey, hey you know what? Everything looks perfect. I can see you in three months unless you have any symptoms, right? However, our current uh, payment models do not support this uh, uh, model. But I think uh, we need to figure out a way to get rid of bulky hospitals. Any, any, any town you go to, the, the biggest facilities are hospitals, huge facilities. And uh, the largest businesses, largest employers are hospitals. Question is, is that necessary? Is that what driving up the costs? Something to think about. So now, palliative care is another critical aspect of cancer care. Most of our patients require palliative care at some point of their life. Now, all of us know that when you, you are born, you have to die. Unfortunately, while you know this, very few of us appreciate that every single day. And as cancer docs, many of us are grounded because we see patients dying, 18-year-olds, 25-year-olds, 50-year-olds, dying every single day, fighting for life and death. So the way clean water, clean air is basic human right for humans should um, dignify death, death in peace and comfort be a basic human right for humans? Does any of us uh, want to die in, uh, in pain? None of us want to do that. So I think it should be a basic human right. It is affordable, easy, and highly effective. Not only does it impact the patient, but the entire family, the entire world around the patient. So what do we do at the foundation? So we established this foundation 10 years ago, and the whole idea is to advocate, educate, and innovate to improve healthcare in underserved communities. This conference is part of advocacy effort, this particular conference. So trying to see how we can make cancer care more accessible. So the debate that we are going to have today afternoon and tomorrow is part of our advocacy effort. We organize medical conferences. We have been organizing conferences every single year in Cordell in Idaho, and that is now one of the largest cancer conferences in Northwest. So this is our model. So I call it pyramid model. So top of the mar uh, pyramid, you have healthcare organizations, healthcare providers, and then that's where you have uh, patients. We are a small nonprofit and we don't have resources to take care of every single patient. So that's why this is where we focus. We help improve capacity. We help develop healthcare facilities and healthcare organization. We help train individuals who are going to take care of these patients. So in 2011, me and uh, Dr. Damiano Rondelli from UIC, we went to Nepal to, give, uh, uh, to organize a couple of conferences and we said, hey, uh, this place does not have any bone marrow transplant center. A country of 30 million people has no bone marrow transplant center. Can we figure out a way to develop one? So we signed an agreement with a public hospital that did not work out. Bureaucracy, corruption, as you can imagine. So after a year or so, one of the doctors contacted me. It's like, can you help us? and develop bone marrow transplant center. And Damiano uh, was a friend of mine, and uh, he was my attending where I was a fellow at UYC. 
I connected with him, I'm like, well, let's uh, work on this. This sounds like an exciting project. So we signed MOU, Foundation, and the, the hospital in Nepal, and UIC, and uh, the hospital there. So we sponsored training of physicians and nurse there to, to come to Chicago at UIC. They got training. And so, so these are the folks who came here. We also sponsored training of uh, this physician. He went to Sri Lanka for two years of training in clinical genetics. And now, all these docs are excited. So we supported development of the first bone marrow transplant center in the country. And now our, our involvement is over. And Damiano facilitates uh, educational and quality control and all that. So essentially, this has been a success story for us and for UIC. So these are the patients being treated there. So that is one of the models. So essentially, helping develop capacity, helping develop healthcare organization, which is self-sustainable and uh, runs on its own. So we also, as I explained to you, hospice and palliative care is very close to my heart. And we are looking at expanding this program globally. And this is what I believe in. Dignified death is a basic human right. So our current programs are in Nepal and India. So in fact, Dr. Pendarkar, who is right here, he helped us um, uh, uh, with uh, a partner with government of India, Madhya Pradesh. So we are helping them develop 51 hospice and palliative care programs. So I went there in November of 2016, met with the physician leaders. I saw their infrastructure and I met with the, the, their bureaucrats and we signed an MOU. So do we have Dr. Walker here? So Dr. Walker here, so he is in Boise and based in, uh, he's based in Boise and palliative care doc. He's one of our board members. He trained uh, this physician from India. We had, uh, we, we sent a couple of nurses to India. They provide training to nine nurses there. And now they are going to be master trainers who are going to provide training to other nurses. And this year, at the end of this year, we are planning to go there for a few weeks to provide more training. So we are hoping that we will have approximately 51 hospice and palliative care, uh, hospice and palliative care programs in Madhya Pradesh. It is a state of 73 million people. Have no hospice program, no palliative care program. I met with Secretary of Health at Madhya Pradesh smart fellow, Harvard trained, and his father was suffering from end-stage disease. And he was telling me how hard it was for him to take his father to a doctor's office. And he was super excited about these programs. So we are also, we have developed our own electronic medical record because I think quality control is critical. While we develop programs, we have to have good quality. So. The EMRs that we have here that have meaningful use and whatnot, they are totally useless outside the United States. I don't know how useful it is here. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the EMR that we have developed, it, uh, it is essentially very simple. So a doctor takes history and uh, examines the patient and uh, comes with uh, assessment and plan after analyzing data. So you have a place to document all that. You have a place where you can look at lab and radiology and pathology. You can see what drugs they have, they're taking, and what kind of allergies they have. So simple medicine. That's what I learned as a medical student. And uh, that's what all of us did. So we are hoping that that is, that is going to be implemented at all our global uh, sites. So similarly, we have developed program in Nepal. And this is a physician we trained, and he's providing services there at patient's home. So it has been tremendously um, satisfying experience for us. Our next major project is going to be developing a multi-million dollar cancer center in southern uh, part of Nepal. 
So this is approximately, this is where it is. So it is approximately 100 miles away from Kathmandu. Now 100 miles does not take one and a half hours. It takes 12 hours to travel there. So that is how the traffic and roads are. So essentially, apart from this area, there is no cancer center anywhere else in the country. All the cancer centers and resources are right here in Kathmandu. So we believe developing a cancer center here is not only going to help <coughs> millions of people in Nepal, but also in India. It is right at the border of Nepal and India. So this is where all the cancer centers are right now. And this is the most populous state with five and a half million people. This is the second most populous state with 5.2 million people and has no, no cancer program in that area. So that, uh, I'm hoping that that program is not only going to be providing state-of-the-art cancer care, but also will be hub for research and education. So um, that would be a major project for us. We are in the process of finalizing an agreement with the government of Bhutan, which is in South Asia. So we are going to help them develop their own cancer program. Small country, around 800,000 people, but have no cancer <coughs> center. They don't have any hospice and palliative care program. So we are looking forward to helping them with this. So how do we do this? Well, look at this. This is what we got in five years. This is our revenue total. This is our staff. All right. And this is what we have been able to accomplish. So we are small, but I think we are mighty. So we want to make sure that we always try to punch above our weight. And we want to make sure every single dollar goes too far to impact as many lives as possible. I would like to thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. So we're going to uh, go and move on to the panel session. Uh, we're slated for 2 to 2.15, so you ended uh, right on time. Um, so we have the two microphones here in the center, so please come up, uh, state your name and your affiliation, uh, and speak into the microphone, please. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, please come up. Uh, I'd like to start uh, with the first question. Dr. Shaw, this is for you since you ended on, on that high point. How can we learn from your experiences, um, not only in Nepal, but in India, in a, uh, but, but how do we apply some of those experiences, say, to our inner cities that, that often, uh, or our rural uh, environments that often are resor resource poor and are struggling with some of the similar issues that uh, third world countries are? So I guess one of the things we need to look at is how we can understand the local situation. Because, uh, for example, the bone marrow transplant program that has been successful because we understand the local situation there. The first one was not possible because of bureaucracy and corruption. We, were, we failed to understand that partnership. So it is critical that we have credible partnership with community. We need to know the, uh, know the uh, leaders there in the community. We need to know what their needs are. Many a times, what do you think is right may not be right for them. So it is critical that you have effective partnership. And I think partnership is the key in moving forward. Yes. This reminds me, actually, of what patient advocates are doing in the US as well. Uh, I think the oncology community is realizing, uh, actually, just through a few patient advocates that um, in metastatic disease, for example, it's not feasible what's happening um, to get for each trial a separate molecular test and wait weeks for results. And they can do this maybe for one or two trials at most, and then they're running out of time. Uh, and the same with um, inclusion criteria or exclusion criteria. I think it was the breast advocacy community uh, that, that alerted us to some of the issues. But I have a question for Chris. Um, it's really remarkable. You have you know, really dissected disparities in hematologic malignancies. Really, congratulations. How much do you think is comorbidities? I thought it was a lot, but then you're showing us the Herceptin <clears throat> data and showing us that that actually got rid of a lot of the disparities, yeah. which is amazing. And uh, where do you think 
yeah, things are going there. So is it mostly biology at this point? Yeah, so that's a, that's a fantastic uh, question. First, I want to pick up on your uh, first point about patient advocacy, and I think that is absolutely critical uh, and a com critical partner in this. Um, so all of the work that I showed you towards the tail end about uh, the understanding the geography and the geographic using uh, a geographic information system to be able to map the patterns of incidents in lymphoma in the state of Georgia, that all came from patients and patient advocates that were saying, we have more, ins we have, my, my neighbor has lymphoma, I have lymphoma, can you do something to look at this? And after the third or fourth time that happened, I said, sure, we can figure out a way to do this. And we brought in people from the School of Health who had exp expertise uh, in, in public health and that, to be able to apply that to that question. And we did actually find that there were geographic differences. And we've done other epidemiologic work looking at exposures in, in those different computers to try and figure that out why. Um, related to your question of, about uh, comorbidities, comorbidities does play a role in this as well. It is probably as much of a cofactor um, as some of the things that I showed you in biological um, disparities. Obesity appears to play a role and diabetes appears to play a role in the ways that uh, patients are able to receive uh, completion of therapy. So I, I showed you at a high level kind of the socioeconomic disparities and who gets any treatment versus no treatment, but there obviously are gradations in who gets complete and completes therapy and their total cycles of therapy uh, as opposed to do who doesn't. Um, and that also has an impact and that's how comorbidities probably impact that as well. The next level of that, though, is we're starting to understand uh, some of the biology of comorbidity of those comorbidities. And so uh, Lauren McCullough, who's an investigator who works with us uh, now, who m moved uh, from University of North Carolina, who was involved in some of the breast cancer work there in African Americans, is now understanding the biology of obesity and how the biology of obesity impacts uh, drug metabolism and uh, probably uh, impacts the, the, the genetics of the lymphoma. So we actually have another grant that was submitted just recently trying to look at those interactions between comorbidities and the biology. Yes. I wanted to add a, 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 to the question you asked before, what, what can we do to bring to the country, to the U.S. here, our communities, what we do in, uh, in uh, low-income countries, which is actually successful. And if I, I, if I see what we heard this morning and uh, the all, all through the whole day, um, we, have, we heard examples of, of uh, great work in, in, uh, in India or in Nepal and other countries in Brazil. Um, I think there are two elements that, by working with, uh, with Binet and with the entire foundation and, and developing more projects all around the world, I think we've learned and just, that could be applied to here. One is to empower the partners. Partnership is, is key, but we, we need to be able to empower the partners in those countries or in our communities to become themselves, um, in, to be accountable and to, 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 be, uh, to be capable of learning and, and teaching themselves through our help. The second thing which I think is very key uh, is to develop the culture of quality management uh, in these areas, in underserved areas. Everything is enough. Uh, even one, one thing is more than nothing. But actually, after, the, after a while, it is not really uh, enough. And to develop a culture of quality, even in our communities, uh, Poverty is not a limit, a, a limit to, to quality. And I think that's a very key important thing for the future. Thank you, well stated. So um, Dr. Flowers, a question I have, um, which really speaks to precision medicine. So in our age, we, we hear about all the omics, we hear about big data, and uh, I think one of the big questions that comes up is how do we incorporate uh, social determinants uh, in these big data sets? You know, how does that work? Um, uh, can you shed some light on how, how to approach that? Fantastic question. And, and we very commonly start the question of precision medicine from the, the areas that you talked about. Um, you know, uh, genomics like the, the areas that we're moving to, metabolomics uh, like some areas that you've been uh, involved with, pharmacogenomics. But the first level of precision has to start at precision at the levels that you were talking about. And so until we have data on 
the number of cancer cases that occur within a region, the most common causes of cancer, the most common causes of cancer death within a region, and put those in the hands of the local decision makers, like uh, what you heard at the, the beginning in terms of what's going on in Chicago, like what you have done in Nepal and, and other areas, we can't have precision until we have precision data at that level. And in many places, we don't even have precision data at, at those levels in terms of the number of, of cancer cases, the most common causes of cancer death. And, and in particular, as we start to get to uh, subsets of cancers, like what I showed you with diffuse large B cell lymphoma in a microcosm, we need to eventually drill down uh, to, to those levels in, in, in local areas. Once we have those kinds of levels of data and we see that there are disparities at those levels, then we can start to tease apart kind of what all these different cofactors. And I used the, the example uh, that I gave as one where we have actually started to drill through those different levels and determined where their factors uh, like socioeconomic status is affecting uh, the therapies that patients with diffuse large B cell lymphoma, where are their factors were, uh, where are their situations where we can identify people who got the exact same treatment and there still are differences in outcome, and then you can start to uh, delve into those biological factors. But I think you need to work your way through each of those levels of a multi-level model before you can get to the biology and not start at the biology and work your way back up. Yes. Dr. Shaw, very impressive what you've done with a small but mighty organization. Could you share some of how you've leveraged such uh, relatively small amounts of money and such a small staff to do some things that seem like they would need a huge organization? Um, obviously, you've leveraged other people you work with. Could you share how you did that as such a small not-for-profit? So um, ever since I remember, I want, always wanted to do something like this. <clears throat> So I was talking to Dr. Flowers earlier. Mother Teresa is my hero, and uh, I always admire what she had done. After I came to the United States, all of a sudden I started making $3,000 a month, which I had never seen in the past. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a huge deal for me. It was a big deal. So I thought I could spare 10% of my income. It would not impact any aspect of my life and still have huge impact in those places. So what I do is not necessarily my job. It is my hobby. And as you know, hobby is always fun. It, you don't get stressed by it, right? So me and my wife, Tara, who is right there, so we, <clears throat> eat, uh, we eat and we breathe and we sleep nonprofit. That's all we do. So I always believe that being efficient and effective is the only way to move forward. And I also believe that since we don't have any money, much money, how can we do the most we can with whatever is available? And my staff, uh, Aaron and, uh, uh, Aaron, can you raise your hand? And Briley, uh, Briley, are you here? So these two, so the way I'm frugal, they have become frugal too. <laughs> so, yeah. So every time we try to create something like this, we look for the cheapest place <laughs> in, in the whole country. So essentially trying to maximize, you know, because we believe that it's my money. Whoever donates, that is like you know, the least amount of money we want to spend for the maximum benefit. Unlike the culture here, where you have some organizations, 90% of the income goes in administration. For example, I'll give you an example. The EMR, right? How much do you think it would cost to build it? Give me a rough uh, number. Hundreds of thousands. We build it for six thousand dollars. Wow. And just just to go off that question, because I find it uh, very interesting, uh, when you showed up the stats on the the, the amount of money and then the, the small staffing that you have, how did you go on about developing these international partnerships? And, and how do you foresee you to continue to do so? I would imagine your pace will probably pick up. I think you'll be sought out, uh, sought out to help with the uh, development of these partnerships. Um, uh, but give me just an idea of, of what you've done and where you think you're going. So, well, I'm originally from Nepal, so it is easy for me to develop partnerships there because I know tons of people there. My mother was from India, 
and I know a lot of people in India. And of course, I have great friends like Dr. Pendarkar, who has been able to connect me with uh, folks in India. So it was interesting. Um, there are tons of people who essentially connect with you uh, without you realizing they know you. For example, one of the physicians from India, he's from Punjab, one of the states in India. He contacted me on LinkedIn, and he said, well, you need to work with me. I'm like, listen, if there is something that's sustainable, that is doable, I will do that. But if you want me to just uh, give you money, that's not going to work, <laughs> because we don't have money. So he is a really passionate. He kept working on it for the last couple of years. And now he has been able to connect me, uh, connect me with government of Punjab and government of Bhutan. And we are uh, you know, kind of realizing new relationship and new partnership. So essentially, there are tons of people out there who are passionate about it, who think alike. So it is creating a group of people around you who think the same way you think and who have different uh, skill sets and who are smarter than you. I think that's what is helping me. For example, this conference, this is our first disparity conference. And the reason I have been able to do this is because you know, all of you are smarter than me, and I brought you here. <laughs> well, thank you. All right, with that, we're going to go ahead and close the session. Uh, I'd like to, again, thank the panel for presenting. Thank you very much. This was great.